Hey everyone, I'm Jenny Clary. I'm your transformational nutrition coach. And today I wanted to talk about salt, sugar, and fat, how the food giants hooked us. And haha, that's actually the title of this book by Michael Moss. And so I'm going to be basing a lot of this stuff off of this. Um, if you want to know more about the Book a Day Challenge, check out the links below so you can read about it and how you too can read so much more. Knowledge is power. Anyways, back to salt, sugar, and fat. I typically try to read a little bit of the introduction always. And so I thought this one did a really good job of explaining it, of... Um, how even the food companies themselves are hooked on salt, sugar, and fat. And this is because of their relentless drive to achieve the greatest allure for the greatest possible cost has drawn them to three ingredients time and time again. So sugar not only sweetens, it replaces more costly ingredients like tomatoes in ketchup to add bulk and texture. For a little added expense, a variety of fats can be slipped into the food formula to stimulate overeating and improve the mouthfeel. And salt, barely more expensive than water, has miraculous powers to boost the appeal of processed foods. So that's just a quick summary of salt, fat, and sugar. And I thought it was really interesting because he talks real quickly about Cheez-Its, which normally he can just like eat forever, Michael, and uh, they created a saltless version for him. And without any salt, the crackers lost their magic. They felt like straw, chewed like cardboard, and had zero taste. Just to let you know... The true meanings, if they the, the food industries didn't have salt, sugar, and fat to, you know, manipulate food to have it taste certain ways, that really, that's not really how they taste like. So I started off with reading the, one of the chapters about exploiting the biology of children, focusing on sugar. And this is always like, even though I don't have kids, like I still, ah, like it pains me to read this. But it also kind of makes me feel better because it helps me to know that sugar is a learned behavior and it happened while I was growing up and this is why I love sugar so much and why all of us love sugar so much. So check this out. Kids didn't just like sugar more than adults. This scientist, Laura, I can't even talk right now, Lawrence Green pointed out in a paper published in 1975. 1975, okay? Data show they were actually consuming more of the stuff, and Green suggests that there might be a chicken and egg issue at play. Some of this craving for sugar may not be innate in kids, but rather is the result of the massive amounts of sugar being added to processed foods. Scientists call this a learned behavior. And Green was one of the first to suggest that the increasingly sweet American diet could be driving the desire for more sugar which he wrote may or may not correspond to optimal nutritional practices, of course. In other words, the sweeter the industry made its food, the sweeter kids liked their food to be. Crazy, but so true. And they talk about real quickly about this like bliss point of finding just the right amount of sugar that food companies try to find in, shoot, uh, in foods. Not too high in sugar, not too low, just perfect to get you buying more and more and more. And so Michael went on one of these um, tests where they're trying to find a bliss point, and uh, it was for pudding. And it was for Tatiana's bliss point for the pudding. And they found out that Tatiana's bliss points for the pudding was 24% sugar, twice the level of sweetness that most adults can handle in pudding. As far as children go, she was on the lower side. Some go as high as 36%. What we find is that the foods that are targeted to children, the cereals and the beverages, they are way up. Um, and Tatiana's favorite cereal is Cinnamon Crunch. And so, you know, even though there's these individual differences, but as a group in every culture that has been studied around the world, children prefer more intense sweetness than adults. 
this is crazy. So this might make you actually feel better that, you know, we've been learned to love sugar. And even though as babies, we naturally love sugar, it's in our biology. Ugh. It's in our biology. We're wired to love sugar. And there's nothing wrong with loving sugar. But when people know this and, you know, kind of just give us more and more and more of it, it kind of just like becomes this learned behavior that we automatically just want more and more sugar. But instead of playing the victim role and just being like, wah, 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 I love sugar, I love sugar, the industry, the food industry has ruined me and I'm stuck and I'm in this way forever, that isn't the truth. Hello, I used to be there just as well. Food coming out on one. I loved my sugar. You'll see my <laughs> pictures of my logos. I'm holding like ice cream and cakes and all these sugary desserts because I was like a sugar fiend queen and I loved it and I got so much happiness from it. So I feel you. But there is a way to break out of that. Okay? So don't let that stop you. And I also just wanted to say a quick statistic um, later on in the chapter. They say the overconsumption of sugar in solid foods or drink has increasingly been tied to the obesity ed epidemic, which has grown more and more. One of the statistics that I thought was crazy was overeating is now a global issue. In China, for the first time, the people who weigh too much now outnumber those who weigh too little. China, these were like little people, like none of them used to be overweight. This is crazy, you know? And even in France, you know, where obesity has climbed from 8.5% to 14.5% since 1997. Or um, also, of course, US is always the most obese in the world because of the food industry. That's what I'm saying. And I thought was even more crazy was even though there's kind of reaching a plateau among adults at 35%, they are still climbing among the group that is the most vulnerable to the food industry products, children. The most recent data from 2006 to 2008 shows that obesity among kids aged 6 to 11 jumped from 15 to 20%. This is craziness, okay? So you know, moms, parents, even like me with other kids, like you need to become aware of this and, you know, help our kids because they're like the most vulnerable. They're learning this learned behavior. If you give them that soda pop or whatever, it's not going to be helping them. Trust me. Like, I don't care how much they cry. Don't give it to them. <laughs> um, okay. I'm laughing just because I know how hard it must be because I was a sugar queen. So I would just keep crying to my mom like chocolate milk because it has a lot of sugar in it <laughs> or whatever ice cream. Like I would always be the annoying kid that would do that. So I also wanted to jump and talk about in a different section, he talks about salt, but it's actually just about addiction in general. This is so true to my heart. And I love how beautifully it's really explained here. So Paul Breslin frames the question of addiction a little differently. When people abuse drugs long enough, he noted the motivation to take more drugs becomes less a matter of wanting the benefit of the drug the high, and more a matter of wanting to avoid the awful feeling generated by the craving itself. I'm going to repeat that. It becomes less a matter of wanting the benefit of the drug, the high, and more a matter of wanting to avoid the awful feeling generated by the craving itself. Similarly, when people start feeling hungry, they're not seeking the primary benefit of food, the calories needed to keep them alive. Rather, they are responding to the body's signal that it does not ever want to be put in the position of needing to eat. Most people in America never feel true hunger pain, the gut-wrenching result of being starved for nutrition. Consider how often people say they feel hungry during a single day. Breslin said, with few exceptions, we can go a day without food or water with no problem whatsoever. 
your body comes to expect that we will feed it. And it has all of these mechanisms in place. So if you don't do it, then you start to feel awful. Ultimately, you end up feeding yourself in order to feel okay. This notion that we eat not so much for pleasure as we do to ward off an awful feeling. So I'm going to repeat that. This is so true if you really think about it. And when you are in your cray cray cravings, if you can be aware enough, strong enough to stop yourself and to really think and become aware, you will start to notice that, you, that we eat not so much for pleasure as we do to ward off an awful feeling. And so um, Michael goes on because this reminds him of a work from Howard Mushkoswitz and who engineered the new flavor for Dr. Pepper. In this study he dubbed Crave It, he found that people are drawn to foods that are heavily salty, sweet, or fatty for reasons other than hunger. They are drawn to these foods by emotional cues and the wish to avoid the lousy feeling that the body generates as a way to defend against starvation. The fear of hunger is deeply rooted, and food manufacturers know well how to push the buttons that evoke this fear. Um, and then he gives the example of the Snickers bar. Don't let hunger happen to you. Um, so think about that. It's so true. I know it's true for me most, most like 99% of the time, like I am really not hungry when I'm having these cravings. And so if you can just be so aware and to kind of just talk to yourself and let your brain be smart to overcome it instead of like your natural, like, running around with your head cut off thinking like, I need food, I need food now, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. That's just your, you know, your old critter brain talking to you to try to survive you because it's used to just eating, you know, like me back in the days, it's used to eating like so much like cake and cookies and everything that it's just like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? You always have sugar. Like, why aren't you giving me my sugar, right? So really just becoming aware of that. So I would love for you guys to start trying to do that, kind of ponder some of these things. I mean, these are scientists, like don't even just listen to me, like these are scientists saying this, you know? And even, don't even listen to the scientists. I want you to try this out on yourself and give yourself like some power, you know? So the next time you have this hunger, this craving that you typically have for whatever it is, if it's chips or whatever, notice if you want to eat more after it. And then another thing is to notice, okay, well first, Sorry, that will be number two. Number one is to first notice if you're actually really hungry. Like, is your stomach, like, grumbling? Like, not because it's digesting food or, you know, it's so full that it's actually making noises too. Like, it's really making those hunger pains because it's hungry. Like, are you really that hungry? Or is it something else? Are you feeling something? Is it just because your body's feeling... Um, you know, uncomfortable for the need to eat food. Remember what I was saying, if you're so used to just eating all the time, which I used to be too, I just felt like I, I need to eat. Like I, I'm used to eating all the time, so I need to eat, right? Versus me actually being really hungry. That's why I actually even went on... Um, a fasting because I wanted to really tap back into my true hunger because a lot of us are delusional. We really don't even know what our true hunger is. And it's crazy how our body can function so well with so little food. It's kind of really crazy. And I'm not saying you have to eat little amounts of food, but just being really cautious about this. So that's one thing. And number two is after you eat the food, do you actually get full or do you have more cravings to eat it more? And typically, when you want to eat more of it, it's because 
it's not really because of your hungry. It's because of this processed food, the salt, fat, and sugar that they manipulated for you to want to overeat more, right? And to eat more of it and to get happy off of it, you know? It is a drug, right? Like the sugars that they're manufacturing now, they're 200 to 600 times way more powerful than regular sugar, and I always use my bananas as a rule. <laughs> and you can pick pretty much any fruit or vegetable. Whenever I just eat a plain, like not, and this is why I prefer a banana is a really good example, or an apple. Um, if I just eat a plain banana or an apple, and let's say I'm starving and I eat even maybe five or ten bananas, I, I even at that ten banana, if I am completely full, I will not want another banana. And even if I just only eat one or two bananas, I do not want to eat another banana. Like it doesn't make me want to be like, keep eating more bananas. It doesn't have this addictive quality to it. But <laughs> if I eat a potato chip, you know, what's the classic one from Pringles? You can't just eat one, right? And there's a reason why. It's because they <laughs> made it that way so that you're going to want to eat more than one, right? And you're going to want bags and bags of it. Like, literally, like, I can eat, like, what is those cans of... I can eat a whole can of Pringles, like, easily. And I can do two cans, like, easily if I really wanted to. <laughs> Probably even more than that. And that's because they made it that way. So when you eat certain kind of processed foods, and sometimes this isn't even super obvious, like people know like, oh, cookies, yeah. Um, it can even be some foods that are kind of, you know, healthy, but because, you know, even if you go to a, a nice restaurant, they still put chef, <laughs> the fat, sugar, and salt in it, and, you know, they put in, they make their own bliss point so that you want to keep eating that as well, too. So this is why I use either, like, the banana or the apple or, you know, a carrot, like, nothing that has salt, sugar, and fat on it because, honestly, when you eat it at its raw course, like, you're not going to get those crazy cravings. And I'm not trying to be extreme and saying like avoid all salt and sugar because that's not possible. But if you think about it, banana is sugar. <laughs> Apple is sugar. And it also like it has all this other amazing nutrients in it as well. And that's going to be a totally different video in itself. But this video is pretty long as it is because I get so um, passionate about foods. <laughs> but I want you guys to try those two things if you are, if you have this natural tendency to eat salt, sugar, and fat and must have everything with salt, sugar, and fat. And I always challenge my bodies. There's times where I'll just go without salt or I'll go without sugar, um, processed sugar or whatever. Or, um, or fats even. Like there's sometimes where I cook food and I don't add oils to any of my foods. And it's crazy to some people. They're like, what? How can you cook with no oils? And I was like, I just use water to cook and make my dish. You know, I don't need to add oil to it. And I'm not trying to say, you know, all oils are bad or you have to avoid it completely. But I'm just saying, why don't you give your body this test and, you know, challenge it more and not be so stuck in the typical black and white of certain things, you know? So give that a try. I would love to hear if you gave it a try or what your thoughts are about salt, sugar, and fat, about this whole child obesity, of it being a learned behavior, how it's not really your fault, but how you can also take back control of it with knowing this knowledge and trying to avoid certain things and trying to be very cautious about this and seeing if you're eating certain things out of just the need to eat it to, you know, than for really just pure hunger, physical hunger, you know, and if you are going to be eating something because of emotional need, like acknowledge it and, you know, really sit with it and be with it and explore that instead of just like being mindless about it, which I usually do and most people do. So really being cautious about that. I would love to hear about that in the comments below. Also, I would love to have you like this video. If you like this video, I mean, if you're actually listening to almost 20 minutes of this, that was really long. <laughs> 
definitely like this, please subscribe to my channel where I will talk more about, you know, living the fulfilled life through mind, body, and spirit, going beyond food, going beyond the body so that you can get this beyond happiness, you know? And also, I love to end my videos with, um, you know, you are an amazing being, you're a superstar, please, please, please don't let anybody deter you from going to your bliss point without food and you just being your amazing self and not reaching that because you feel like you have to act a certain way or be a certain way to be loved or appreciated or feel important, which is totally not true. So I'm telling you right now, you are amazing at your authentic being and self and please shine that light of yours. I will talk to you guys later and... Take care. Bye.